Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range technical forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Well, it was nice to see a satellite animation early this morning where much of the weather across the country was quite benign, not a whole lot going on here. And that's because the jet stream flow is relatively flat and it's pretty far to the north, which is why a lot of the country is experiencing above average temperatures for this time of year. Just to take you in and show you a couple of things we're watching, though, in the near term, there is a large low that is sitting off of the coast of British Columbia. And it's a part of a, a deeper trough that will be cutting into parts of the Pacific Northwest and then into the Inner Mountain West before ejecting here into the high plains in the Canadian prairies. Uh, which is going to produce quite a bit of, of winter weather, which we'll talk about in a few moments. But also just want to point out today, uh, we do have some very strong winds that are moving across parts of Montana over into North Dakota and southern Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. But some great winds coming out of the south here, really building back in some warmth after what was a very cold month of October. Okay, in the tropics, we do need to be discussing what's going on with Hurricane Ada, now downgraded to Tropical Storm Ada. Uh, this was a couple of days ago, uh, back on the 3rd, as it was, or I guess yesterday, as it was slamming into um, the coast here in parts of Central America. It rapidly intensified. We actually saw the pressure drop 54 millibars in 24 hours. So that's about 2 millibars an hour, which is rapid intensification of this system. But what we need to see is as it once again emerges from parts of Central America, some of the longer range guidance both from the National Hurricane Center which is the inset figure and the figure in the background which is the European Ensemble are trying to bring what's left of Ada out here allow it to strengthen back into a tropical storm and then potentially impact parts of the southeast maybe Florida but that's still another week away uh, so we're talking about next Monday Tuesday Wednesday time frame that we're going to be concerned about that if the current track and speed of the system remains the same so we still have more to be watching here in the tropics now I told you that jet stream pattern was relatively benign and this is what it looks like midday today. So you can see while we're backed up a little bit here over parts of the North Pacific into the Gulf of Alaska, the flow is generally zonal across much of North America before building into this huge ridge here that is sitting over uh, parts of the North Atlantic. But flow like this generally just relaxes everything. It's not the type of flow that gives us a whole lot of upward motion in the atmosphere. And all the clouds we got were just from this little shore of kicking through here, which you just saw a few moments ago. But higher pressure sitting over parts of the East Coast has been a major component of this of this pattern here in the near term. Now, what's changing is what's going on in the North Pacific. And I, I want to show you something. I don't often show this in my videos, but it's a cool tool that we have. It's called the NOAA High Split Model. It's a trajectory model. So I'm concerned about snow in parts of Montana, uh, Idaho, uh, going up into the southern Canadian prairies. And so what I did was I, I ran a, a, a back trajectory on where the air is coming from in that area. And so what you're seeing here is, is kind of the source region. So we have some of the air that's coming here out of parts of the North Pacific. Some of it's getting caught up there just off the coast of California, Oregon, and Washington. But you can almost see the trajectory. Let me just draw this maybe in red here. That's going to be coming across just like this. And as it does so, it's going to uh, really uh, invigorate a system that's going to be quite strong and linger for a while in the western U.S. before pulling out in the central plains by the early next week. So we come back to that flow pattern today, and you can, again, see the troughs are they're tucked here. Uh, Gulf of Alaska, here, Canadian Maritimes, and the jet stream is very far to the north, and that's that's why we have the warmth. We'll take a look at that in just a few moments. But what you're going to see in this animation, though, is just repeated troughs digging into this area. Ready? So as we play this on through, this is now getting us out toward the end of this week. Watch that with me one more time here. Let's pause it right there. This would be now Friday morning afternoon and evening. I mean, look at the trough as it dives in here. Uh, and, and it's been well forecast. It was here last week. Uh, so this is a pretty robust solution. Well, that's going to then kind of pivot around. And one of the reasons why is because right here coming through parts of British Columbia is a second trough. So you can just imagine the flow around this one is like this. It's the same down here. But this is going to help to pick up the southern trough and pull it quickly to the north and east. See, it just flings it around just like that. So here it is. And as this ejects here over the weekend into this part of the United States, it's going to kick off a pretty big cyclone running through there. But overall, the broader trough by next week is still hanging out over the southwest. So one piece builds here through parts of you know Manitoba over toward uh, Ontario, and the second piece is still sitting here. Meanwhile, by Monday afternoon, you do see that this is where the latest European operational run is putting um, ADA at this point, and we're going to have to watch carefully to see what its strength is going to be. But what's going to allow it to get into Florida is the ridge to the north. 
and that's just going to kind of open the gateway here. All the strong wind shear, all the main flow is going to be tucked away in the mid part of the United States. So as we let this go into midweek next week, did you see that? It just keeps pivoting right here, pivoting around this deeper trough, sending little short waves out, which kick systems off in the midsection of the United States. And then even as that tries to leave here, and I know we're at the end of an operational run, you can once again see that by Friday the 13th, uh, we're now digging in another feature here into the Pacific Northwest. And we want to talk about that. But first, what are the implications? As I let this play forward, we're, again, we're just looking here at our operational European run. Not a whole lot going on until about right here. I just let it play all the way through Saturday afternoon. It'll be at that point, strong southerly winds here in the midsection of the country. Our trough is digging in, so it's already cut into the Pacific Northwest, and the low is taking shape over the mountains. So as I go from Saturday afternoon into Sunday morning, now the low begins to emerge. Now look at the snow we're going to be adding here to the northern Rockies, to parts of the Cascades getting down to the Sierra Nevada, even over to the parts of the central Rockies in through here, pushing that snow up against those west-facing slopes. Well, then as this low emerges into North Dakota, we're going to have to watch carefully right into this part of, of Manitoba, getting back into Saskatchewan for some ice, but some almost blizzard-like conditions on the back side of this in parts of Montana. We'll have the snow, we'll have the winds. You can see it there. The question will be about the duration at this point, because going from Sunday night into Monday morning, very quickly, this system's pulling into Southern Manitoba. Now, I do want you to be aware that on the south side of this, the potential for some storms down here is in the cards. So we're going to watch that very carefully. Meanwhile, this is where Ada is currently sitting. And tomorrow when I do my next update, we'll see if this moves very much. But this is where it's currently sitting by Monday morning. Now, remember, there's another reinforcing kind of kicker on the backside, another shortwave coming around here. So as I go from Monday, watch this, there goes system number one toward the Hudson Bay. That second trough emerges here in the central plains of the U.S. We've now seen several runs that want to get enough cold air on the back side of it for painting some snow in this area. I'll show you those snow forecasts in a few moments. But maybe, again, some storm activity down here in parts of Missouri, uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, uh, even into Texas. Now, notice uh, Ada sitting in the Gulf of Mexico. When does it ever get to the U.S.? Maybe not until next Wednesday. And there's a lot of question marks on whether or not it ends up here. But notice this, it's now the 12th. Here's our next trough kicking in here to the Pacific Northwest. And that's when we just look at this pattern as it's setting up, well, we can just kind of look at snow first. So we're gonna look at the European ensemble. I'm just gonna show you the ensemble to get us going here. Total accumulated snowfall. So the Cascades, the Sierra Nevada, look right here in this part of the Rockies. This has been a place that's been in deficit of snowfall so far this year in Idaho. Well, they're gonna get it. Remember this flow is coming just like this. And then right in through this area, Southern Alberta, this part of Montana, cutting into, Al uh, excuse me, into um, Saskatchewan, up into uh, uh, parts of Manitoba, big snows in through there. This might be an area that misses it. And then the second system, possibly increasing snowfall chances here. Now we can look at the probability of getting at least six inches and you can see the high amounts that are forecast here. And with those winds, I am concerned about blizzard conditions in this area with ice out ahead of it. Going from there over to precipitation, I'm going to show you the operational European run here. So this is the operational run, just so you can start to see the streaks that are in this area out ahead of the two lows. So remember, the first one goes like this, and the second one comes in like that. And those two lows as they move through are going to have the chance in this area for increasing precipitation amounts. So this is all snow in through here, but on the back side here, or excuse me, on the south side of it, that's where we're going to be watching for showers and possibly some thunderstorms. And then again, over here in the east, uh, we're starting to see some heavy rains showing up here in the mid-Atlantic, getting into North Carolina. And what happens with the moisture from Ada? That's going to be a wild card for the southeast as we look out into next week. So let's now you do the same thing. This is the probability of getting an inch of liquid equivalent. So remember, all of that is snow. But what you've got in through here on the back side of it that we could have snow in that quarter, but some heavier rains are possible in through parts of Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, Wisconsin in this area. The probability, again, of getting an inch. So we look here, we're 50 to 80 percent in that area. Also, come back over to the Appalachian Mountains and the Mid-Atlantic. We see that as well. And the wild card, once again, will be where Ada goes from here. That's what we are still waiting to kind of decipher from some of our long range guidance. OK, by day 10, trough, trough, but see the ridge out east. That's the pattern we discussed. So the flow comes around it just like that. And so what this means is it's going to continue to keep this section of the country wet and the west also wet but but cold as well. 
So this is the first time in a while that we've seen the European ensemble really picking up on positive anomalies for Northern California, uh, for much of the interior of the Pacific Northwest. So this pattern of keeping dropping these troughs in that area is going to keep it wet. And then remember, as it runs up here over the ridge to the east, good upper level support, a lot of moisture transport out of the Gulf of Mexico. So that's why we got to watch this area into week two for better chances of precipitation. Plus what happens here with ADA. There's a lot going on here just in the next couple of weeks. Those temperature patterns, before we stretch this out, it is a warm one today across much of the U.S., especially in the north central plains of the United States. But you know what's going to happen with this graph. The warmth, as you see, going from Thursday into Friday, Saturday moves east, and the cold from that trough builds into the western United States, such that by Tuesday, you can find the split very easily as to where the, the really the jet stream is going to round the base of the trough and run up just like this. So still very warm in the eastern part of the U.S., but the presence of that trough really knocking temperatures back. So we're going to be seeing, you know, a 50 to 60 degree swing in temperatures just over the next seven days in this section of the United States. Now to show you the temperature patterns beyond that, I'm going to layer these. Okay. So across the top, I got the latest GFS and this is going to be day zero through five, day 10 through 15. Whoops. I'm sorry, not day 10 through 15, but day five through 10 and day 10 through 15 up here and the corresponding maps from the Euro on the bottom. We see models right now are actually in very good agreement about this pattern. Okay, so that's what our temperatures look like. Now let's stretch this out. Here is week three from the European model and week three from the latest GFS extended. So this gets us out to the, almost the end of November. And what I just keep finding is that both models want to keep reinforcing those troughs. Now the question is, are the models behaving according to persistence or is there really something to this that uh, is more consistent maybe with La Nina or more consistent with the MJO? And that's the questions we're going to try to answer as we go toward the end of this video here. So let's talk MJO first. European model has it currently sitting here in phase seven, and it's going to come out into phase eight weekly and probably around the corner here to phase one, two. So what does that mean? Well, this is phase seven, phase eight, phase one, and phase two, and the corresponding historical temperature patterns. So as we're coming out of phase seven, this is the phase we've just spent time in. That cold air is moved to the east. That's what we would expect it. And phase eight, where we are now and where we're going over the next couple of days, well, th that's what you see over here uh, in the map. So very well correlated with the MJO. But notice phase one brings in troughs here and phase two lets them out. So to see that pattern really reflected well in the MJO, it isn't just coincidence. It's part of this. But then the question is, where does the MJO go from there? So I'm going to move the graphic over to the other side. And now let's just say, well, if it comes out over here somewhere and then starts to move over to phase three and four, what would that do to our temperature patterns? So phase three is down here, correlating with November temperatures, and phase four is there. And what we notice is we start to just change the pattern here back over to warm. So what that tells me is, coming back to this, whoops, sorry, that, the week three and week four patterns as established by the models right now are just saying, let persistence guide this pattern. If the MJO had its way and we went back over to phase three and four, we would see, according to history here, some, some warm up happening in the Canadian prairies, some warm up happening, uh, you know, in that area. So we're going to have a lot to watch here and we're going to have to see if the tropics are really the connecting fibers here between the flow and the jet stream over us here in North America uh, and, and what's going on in the tropics. Now, we got a couple other things I just want to keep on your radar. First is going to be the Arctic Oscillation, the polar vortex, okay? So what you're looking at here is a graphic, and we're just sitting right here in November. So I'll, I'll trace over this. I'll do it in white. Right here is what the uh, Arctic Oscillation has been doing. Now, when the Arctic Oscillation is up here in these high values, that's a strong polar vortex. When it's down here in the low values, that's a weak. What we always watch out for is any time where the polar, excuse me, the well, the polar vortex or the Arctic Oscillation, all of a sudden just drops off. If it drops off and weakens, usually in the corresponding three to six weeks, we have a major disturbance in our temperatures. Now, right now, we're not seeing that happen, but we're going to watch it as we move forward. What else am I watching? 
sea ice. Right now, when we think about the sea ice, we are currently sitting well below uh, our historical average, and it's actually the record lowest sea ice that we've seen. And I presented this to you last time or a couple of videos ago that just said whenever we've had low Arctic sea ice that stays low, it typically means some, some colder weather later in the season, like we had in March of 2013 that would follow that March excuse me, that 2012 minimum that we experienced in November. So a, an avenue of cold air here might possibly be a solution we see as we near spring. But what I want to finish up with is a bit of discussion about La Nina. So our La Nina is very well established. Ocean temperatures are below one and a half degrees Celsius in the middle. So this is a moderate to even strong La Nina in the trade winds are responding as a result. This La Nina will likely peak sometime in December and January before starting to recover back toward insular neutral conditions, which means much of our winter is going to be dealing with a developing La Nina, then an established La Nina, and then at the end of it, a weakening La Nina. That's critical as we talk about the spring weather. But I wanted to help people understand what La Nina does, okay? So we know this, right? It typically gives us more ridging in the Gulf of Alaska and a lot of clipper systems along the northern part of the U.S., hence cold there. It tends to be warmer and drier across the south. That's your correlation December through March with La Nina, all right? Now, we've put, picked out these analog gears, and I presented this to you a few times, and we said, hey, those analog gears suggest that would be the case, the flow doing something just like that. That's what the analog gears say. Cold in this area, warm across the south, a storm track across the north, and potentially coming out of the Ohio River Valley as well. But that's more normal. That's climatology. From there, what I want to do is this. Now, let's get a little bit nerdy here and go into some statistics. So I looked across the whole of the northern tier of the United States, and I made a distribution of temperatures. These are daily temperature anomalies for November through March from 1979 to 2019. So we're counting up the anomalies, and these are in degree C. So what you get here is if you're on the right-hand side of the zero line, these are the warmer days, adding them up, and these are the cooler days. And you can see a long tail extending off of the cooler days down here, okay? Now, if that's normal, let me show you what happens if we were having an El Nino, not a La Nina, which we are, but an El Nino. You watch with me. See the shape of the distribution? This is how it changes if there's an El Nino. I'll go back and forth. Normal, El Nino. Normal, El Nino. Do you see the shift in this direction? That typically tells us that when there's an El Nino, we tend to just have more warmer days. It doesn't mean we don't have the colder outbreaks. We just tend to favor warmer conditions. Now, let's do the same thing for La Nina. So let's come back to this figure. This is our normal for 1979 to 2019. Now let's only look at the La Nina years. You ready? Here's normal. There's La Nina. You see, the distribution just shifts, and it now gives us more of these cold days. It doesn't mean we won't have warmth during winter at times, but it shifts the peak of the distribution to the left. You see, that's the kind of shifts we're talking about. I just want to make sure that when people see these forecasts, that this doesn't mean it's going to be cold every single day from now all the way through March. You see, when, when Noah puts this together, it's the whole time period. And therefore, if you shift the distribution around, it just tends to be colder across the northern tier and warmer across the southern. It tends to be wet and snowy where those clippers come through. That is just the average of what happens when there's a La Nina. It doesn't mean it's going to be like this every single day. But to give you some more evidence as we're waiting on the new model runs to come out, they'll come out on the 5th of this month. This is from the IRI Multimodel Group. They also see wetter conditions coming into the northwest, putting a lot of snow in the mountains. Storm track in the Ohio River Valley, also cutting through this part of um, you know, the Great Lakes in Ontario. It sees cold air at times cutting through here, but warmth across the south and possibly warmth over here into the east coast as well. So thinking about that, I want you just to put these maps in the back of your mind because next week when we have the new long range data, we'll kind of add to this analysis. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Thanks.